All right, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Jeff Larkin. I am a software architect in NVIDIA's HPC software team. Uh, my primary focus is on uh, HPC programming models and, and enabling uh, developers to take full advantage of their systems. Uh, I have my video on just to say hi, but I'll turn it off for bandwidth now. So today I'll talk about um, the NVIDIA HPC software stack. Um, I have, uh, if I get this to advance, uh, kind of four high level topics here and, and I've put them in I think the order of importance in case uh, in case we run out of time due to questions. I wanna make sure there's time for questions. Uh, the first topic I wanna to talk about is one that I'm really excited about and that I wanna make sure everyone has heard this message and that's about uh, how you could do accelerated computing uh, using the standard programming languages. So here is you know, our vision for how someone should program to the NVIDIA platform. And I, I wanna first you know, stress the word platform here because uh, although we are historically known for our GPUs and have built our company around our GPUs, uh, we have uh, announced the uh, Grace CPU architecture that's coming out in uh, next year. And we also have the uh, our InfiniBand uh, business as well. And so we have a full hardware platform and therefore we need to provide a, a means, a coherent means for you to program to all of that. Uh, the foundation of this is our accelerated libraries, which we've been building for, uh, for uh, a few decades now. Um, starting off with, we have our core libraries for data structures and algorithms, our math libraries, which is what most people think of and when I say accelerated libraries, these are things like blahs and FFTs and random numbers. Uh, communication libraries to scaling up beyond uh, single nodes. And then we have high level frameworks for data analytics, AI, and most recently we've um, put out software for quantum circuit simulation. Um, this forms a foundation where we can give you a um, you know, very high degree of uh, performance for these operations, but we can also build our programming strategy on top of that. And there's uh, three approaches that I'm going to, to propose to you for how you would program to this platform. Now, I want to start by saying that this is not a choose one and go sort of situation, but in fact, all of these approaches are, are fully composable with each other. So uh, at different points in your application, you may decide that uh, performance is a, a greater concern than uh, portability or, or programmer productivity, and then you may choose our uh, specialization language, which is CUDA. Uh, or if productivity and portability is the highest uh, performance, you may choose accelerated languages. So CUDA is what I would call our platform for innovation, it is where when we uh, release new hardware features or have uh, ideas for new um, you know, programming model features, we would expose them uh, here in CUDA. And so you as a developer, if your goal is uh, the greatest possible performance on the NVIDIA GPU you have, uh, you have full control to write all the way down to the hardware. And we have the ability to expose new hardware features to you very quickly. Um, however, that's, uh, I would say, not necessarily the goal for all developers. And I would actually hope that most developers will actually come to our platform with this bar on the far left, which is the accelerated standard programming languages. Here I'm showing C++ at the top, Fortran in the middle, and uh, Python at the bottom. And all three features, all three here, I'm using features that are in the language. So uh, here at the top is C++ transform operation. And I'm saying this can be executed in parallel. And if you look closely, this is actually just a standard Saxby approach that can be built for a uh, multi-core CPU or GPU without any code changes. In the middle here, we have a do concurrent loop for Fortran that's again, implementing a Saxby. And here the do concurrent specifies that the iterations this loop can be run in any order. And so uh, there are compilers out there that can parallelize it for CPUs or for GPUs and using the same source code. And I'll show you some data for both of those. And the bottom is Python, which is not actually an ISO standard, uh, but, um, but we believe um, through the PyData ecosystem that a very uh, similar sort of developer experience can be accomplished. And here I have an example using a package called Kunumeric as a replacement for a PyData's NumPy. So by developing code with uh, this approach on the left, you have code that is uh, parallel from the start. And so it can come and, and run on our platform or any platform out of the box. Uh, now there's always gonna be a, a bit of a gap between what, uh, you know, what we can develop in CUDA and what has been standardized as, a, as an ISO best practice in, in the ISO standard languages. And to bridge those gaps, 
And to provide you with a uh, portable level of um, optimization, we have compiler directives. And so here I'm showing both OpenACC and OpenMP, for example, uh, managing data movement while using the standard languages to manage the parallelism. Uh, it's our desire that uh, over, over time, uh, the necessity to use this box in the middle will, will shrink away and eventually that you'll find yourself writing far less uh, directive-based code and far more standard-based uh, code. So in each of these cases here, we have a source, you know, a code uh, that can be built for a multi-core CPU or a GPU. Um, and the only thing you have to change is the target you're compiling for. So you can see here using our compilers, uh, specifying multi-core target versus GPU target, uh, but all of the rest of the code remains the same. Now, I don't want you to, to have the impression this is a, a new idea that we just overnight decided uh, that this, you know, we want you writing in standard languages, but we've actually dedicated more than a decade uh, to the development uh, in these languages, in our hardware, in, in our software to support this. And so you know, we have uh, folks from all over the company, hardware engineers, software engineers, um, architects, um, people from every part of the company uh, working in the ISO committees to try to bring their expertise uh, to, the, to these standards. And so although we only began to support uh, standard parallelism in our 2020 compiler releases, um, that was really the result of more than a decade of working within these communities out in the open uh, to bring this, uh, bring this to bear. And it's really over our, our past investments over that decade that have enabled us to make progress. Um, and I'd point over here to the right, I'm not going to read through these directly, but these are many of the major features that have come as a part of those collaborations to bring parallelism into the languages, because we believe that if the languages are parallel, then that's going to be a rising tide raising all of the boats. So uh, the first thing we need in order to enable you to take advantage of these features in the standard languages is great compilers. And so we have our, our HPC compilers. Uh, that are available as part of a, a larger package I'll discuss in a moment for C, C++, and Fortran. And uh, you can guess based on the names which compiler belongs with which. Um, these, um, these compilers are, of course, you know, able to work on our accelerated platforms, including automatic acceleration to the latest GPUs. So as the H100 GPU becomes, uh, becomes available, you'll begin to see support in our HPC compilers for optimizing and building uh, towards uh, those GPUs as well. Uh, we support all of the major programming models I've discussed, you know, standard languages in you know, Fortran and C++, compiler directives from OpenACC and OpenMP, and even uh, in the NVIDIA CUDA platform as well. Now, these are not just GPU compilers, but they're also really solid uh, CPU compilers as well, optimizing for uh, you know, vectorization, uh, multi-core using directives and, and automatic vectorization as well. And it's supported on all of the platforms, so x86, ARM, and open power. So you don't even need a GPU in order to use these compilers, and you can begin to, to benefit from all of these innovations uh, on any platform. Now, these compilers are a small part of our larger product, which is the HPC SDK. Uh, HPC SDK is designed to be a package that provides HPC developers with absolutely everything they need to be successful. So it has support for all of the programming models I discussed. It has four compilers, so our three HPC compilers plus the traditional CUDA toolkit compiler. So everything that's in the CUDA toolkit is also included in the HPC SDK. And we provide a bunch of different libraries from core libraries like Thrust, Cub, and libqc++. Uh, all of the CUDA math libraries, Kublas, uh, QSolver, QFFT, and, and, and more. And then communication libraries. So you're not limited to just uh, GPUs, but this is a broader HPC package that includes uh, an optimized MPI based on open MPI, uh, NV, Shmem, and Nickel. And then because you know, we want developers to be successful, and I believe that developers are only successful as the tools they have available to them, uh, we provide prof profilers, uh, using our insight tools and also debuggers such as uh, CUDA GDB, uh, Compute Sanitizer, and more. So this, uh, this package is 100% free regardless of whether you have a GPU. You don't even need a GPU on your system to uh, download and use it. Um, it's available on x86, ARM, Open Power. Uh, it's pre-installed on many of the, uh, the supercomputing systems within the DOE. And uh, it does release 
about seven or eight times per year. And if you'd like to download it yourself, you can download the package from HBCS, the, from the developer.nvidia.com, or it's available as a container, or if you prefer SPAC or even on all the cloud providers. So it's very widely available. And again, this is the HPC SDK. This is not the GPU SDK. So if you're an HPC programmer, uh, we believe that uh, we've provided a package that uh, you'll find beneficial and I hope you'll um, begin to use it. So now let's focus in a bit more on the programming part. I'm going to start with ISO C++. Um, ISO C++ is currently in, uh, C, in uh, version 20, uh, 23 is expected to be the next version, uh, which comes out next year. And um, you know, this provides a variety of features that uh, can be used within the language for, uh, for parallelism. And the one that I'll talk primarily about here is the parallel algorithms library, which enables you uh, with building blocks to express uh, the parallelism in your code. Now, uh, C++ also has a variety of uh, forward progress guarantees and memory model uh, enhancements that uh, were baked into the language, uh, that were developed over time, but uh, codified in C++ 17, which uh, were necessary in order to make parallel programming possible. So we, you know, the forward progress guarantees uh, you, uh, alleviate the concerns over, uh, over deadlock and the memory model clarifications uh, provide a robust memory model that could be used in parallel programming. Now, at the same time that these were being developed in the in the C++ language, we were developing in our hardware to make sure that we were uh, we had the same uh, guarantees in our hardware. So this enables us to be able to run all of C++ uh, on our hardware. Uh, now, um, you know, 20 is the current release. We're already looking towards the future releases, and there's a variety of uh, exciting features coming for um HPC programmers, and some of them uh, we'll be providing uh, preview support for this year, uh, including MD span, which is a, a way of representing uh, multi dimensional data natively in C. So, a kind of akin to a multi dimensional array in Fortran. Um, range based parallel algorithms to make it simpler to, to port um, you know, multi dimensional uh, 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 loop structures into these parallel algorithms and extended floating point types. And then we're even looking toward C++ 26 uh, with features like the uh, uh, senders receivers framework, which enables uh, you to express asynchrony and concurrency in C++. And we have some very exciting um, results that we're already seeing with using senders receivers to program um, uh, execution graphs within C++ and map that uh, to the hardware and also abstractions for linear algebra. So, uh, you know, we're really committed to the C++ um, uh, programming model uh, going forward. And you can see we've been committed for quite some time. And actually what I, what I show here at the roadmap is with each release builds upon the enhancements from the, 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 from the past releases. And so uh, you can see that over time uh, we've been developing these to, um, uh, to really make C++ a proper um, uh, parallel language. So in terms of what you can do today, I have, I think, two examples in this talk of, of uh, applications that are being written to use C++17. Uh, the first is a mini app from Lawrence Livermore called Lulesh. Uh, it's, it's a fairly small mini app, about 9,000 lines of code, and has a variety of uh, parallel versions. So the baseline version is the OpenMP version, and so that's what we'll be uh, uh, using as our baseline for our comparison. So here is one representative function from the code written in OpenMP. And you can see all of the different things you would expect from an OpenMP code, including a, you know, a parallel pragma here for spawning your, your threads, a, a, a work sharing loop here for uh, taking this loop and uh, spreading its iterations across those threads. And there's even this if def up here to ensure that this code can be run safely both in serial and in parallel. So this is a pretty representative pattern for, uh, for OpenMP codes and, and specifically how OpenMP is written inside of Lulesh. Um, this function can be rewritten using standard C++ using this code on the right. And so you can see the code is a lot more compact um, and which will make it uh, you know, longer term, easier to write, easier to maintain. Um, and it's also fully ISO standard. So you could take this code to any ISO C++ compiler and be able to build it and, and run it. And so that includes not just our compiler, but uh, the GNU compilers, Clang compilers, Intel's compilers, Microsoft's compilers, and more. So in addition to all of those advantages, it actually turns out that this code is faster as well. And so you can see here on the left is the, uh, we're gonna be comparing uh, three compilers, and this is on an AMD Epic uh, CPU platform. Um, 
uh, the first three bars are the baseline open MP, and this is using the default settings for each of the compilers. So uh, if I tweak all of the different environment variables, I can find uh, you know, the right environment variables for G++ and for Intel and for MVC++. And at that point, they all have equal performance with uh, their own preferred um, environment variables. But you can see here that the performance among them is actually fairly close, even from uh, the default settings. Now I can take, now run the ISO C++ code that I showed. Uh, and in case of all three of the compilers, it's actually uh, roughly 2x faster than the original OpenMP code without any um, uh, external uh, dependencies such as OpenMP. Uh, across the board, you know, all these are running on the exact same CPU and getting very good performance. Uh, but what's really exciting is with MVC++, without any changes to the code at all, all I have to do is change one compiler option. I can take that code and take it off the multi-core CPU and run it on the GPU as well. In this case, uh, an A100 GPU. So this is really, uh, really exciting, uh, in my opinion, that you can write code, uh, write code once and expect it to run across both compilers and across platforms without any um, additional API dependencies. Uh, and this isn't limited to just um, mini apps. So here's um, some information from an application called Maya, which comes from RWTH Aachen University. It's about a half a million lines of code uh, written over the course of, of many years. And so with a code that large, it's a multi-physics application with a code that large, uh, you can't expect it to just be rewritten overnight. But what they've started to do is go through individual solvers and refactor them using ISO parallelism. And so here is some uh, one of their uh, is a loop nest that comes from their lattice Boltzmann solver, uh, and you can see that again the code becomes dramatically more compact here uh, using um, fully standard ISO C++. And actually, we get again comparing against um, the OpenMP code, comparable OpenMP performance, and then also uh, a nice speed up going to the GPU. And I'll point out here as well that uh, this is actually after they uh, they tuned their OpenMP code based on their learnings from the ISO C++. So the original OpenMP code was actually quite a bit slower due to some programming errors uh, that the ISO C++ at its higher level of, of extraction actually exposed those errors and enabled them to correct the code. So they get uh, you know this higher level code uh, fully portable and uh, portable to um, uh, the GPU as well. Now we're not limited to uh, C++ in our uh, programming strategy. We're also uh, able to do a lot of parallel programming using Fortran as well. And I know Fortran is still a very important language in many of the labs. So in terms of uh, uh, HPC and, and parallel programming in Fortran, you know, traditionally you know, parallel computing in, uh, in Fortran involved you know, writing your do loops and then adding directives like OpenMP or OpenACC. However, uh, there are now features in the language that enable you to do this natively. Um, and we, uh, we support uh, you know, two of the three of those uh, parallel programming features. So first is the array, uh, the array intrinsic. So things like matmol and reshape, where you can pass in entire arrays and perform these operations across the entire array. Well, there's a lot of parallelism baked into these operations, and we're able to map them to our accelerated libraries. So we've had that support in our compiler since uh, mid-2020. Uh, of course, not everything can be represented natively in these intrinsics. You need to be able to write any sort of code. And for that, you have the ability to write uh, do concurrent loops. Uh, you'll see an example of a do concurrent loop on the next slide if you've not seen it before, but it, uh, it is a replacement for the standard do loop that gives the compiler additional guarantees about the ability to run those loop iterations in, it, in, uh, in any order. And we can actually uh, automatically offload those uh, to the GPU or run it on uh, multi-core CPUs and uh, that's been supported since late 2020. Um, the Fortran language itself also has support for co-arrays for a partition global address space. And I'll acknowledge we don't currently have support for that, although it is something that we're working on and, and do plan to support in the future. Now, one more feature I'll call out from Do Concurrent. So uh, Do Concurrent became available in 2008 using you know, purely data parallel loops. In 2018, they added support for locality specifiers. So you can uh, specify certain variables being private to uh, loop iterations, which enabled representing even more of the, the loops. And uh, uh, 202x, which is expected to be 2023, uh, adds support for reduction. So at that point, you're able to really write uh, uh, virtually any, uh, any loop that you would be able to write with uh, OpenMP or OpenACC natively using do concurrent. 
So this has been uh, put into the committee draft for uh, the next version of Fortran. And because that uh, is already so far along in the standardization process, we already have support for it on our compiler using the reduced subclause and have uh, added support for that last year. So to give you um, two application case studies from this, um, first is MiniWeather. Uh, MiniWeather is a CFD code that is uh, designed as a, really a teaching tool. Uh, it's included as the in the spec HPC benchmark suite, and there's a variety of uh, versions of it available on, at this repository. Uh, so we took the, the Fortran version of it and went through and replaced all of the loop nests with do concurrent loops. And so here, uh, you know, this loop body uh, towards the middle here is exactly the same as the loop body was in the original code. Um, here we had a triply nested do loop, which we've replaced with a do concurrent loop across these three loop indices. Uh, by writing it in this way that I've uh, provided the compiler guarantees about, um, uh, about the loop iterations to enable it to have a lot of parallelism to, to, um, to work with here. Um, and otherwise, you know, this is the, it's actually a fairly light uh, refactoring to get the code to this point. And you can see in terms of performance, uh, the do concurrent code and the OpenMP code perform comparably. The OpenMP code is actually slightly faster in this point due to some uh, affinity decisions that were made in the OpenMP runtime versus our do concurrent runtime. And so we're gonna fix that. Uh, that's a, um, an optimization we're working on. Uh, but the do concurrent version actually can, can then run on uh, the GPU without any code changes. And its performance is actually comparable to the, uh, the handwritten open ACC code as well. So you can get a great CPU and GPU performance without any directives at all. Here's a slightly different story. This is a little bit more complex code called uh, POT3D. This is a production application that uh, studies uh, solar coronal magnetic fields. It's also a part of the spec HPC benchmark suite. Um, and they were, were happily running in production using MPI plus OpenACC. Uh, but as, a, as an uh, academic exercise, they went through and replaced all of their OpenACC with do concurrent loops and to see what was possible. And so uh, here, this is a lower is better. This is a time graph. And the original code here on the left is OpenACC and, and, and MPI. Uh, the next bar is um, do concurrent plus, uh, plus MPI. And you can see there's about a 10% performance loss for them uh, taking out all of the, the open ACC code. 10% um, is not too bad, but they wanted to understand you know, what was the cause of that performance difference. And they actually tracked it down to being uh, the fact that our do concurrent implementation is written to use CUDA managed memory under the hood. And managed memory means you don't have to worry about where your data structure lives, whether it's on the CPU or the GPU. Under the hood, it will be um, migrated to the appropriate place for you. And so uh, they found that the OpenACC plus managed memory had comparable performance. So they took one more step, just uh, again, to, to understand things better. And they actually went in and, and left all of their do concurrent loops, but added uh, open ACC data directives to see if they could get the performance back. And they actually did. And so what they found was they could use Fortran strictly for parallelism and um, open ACC strictly for data, uh, data movement and get comparable performance. Uh, so they recently published a paper on this and they gave a talk at GTC uh, with their findings. They actually show uh, data uh, beyond just uh, what I can show here on one slide. And one more Fortran feature I'll call out is the, the array math intrinsics. Uh, hopefully none of you have this uh, triply nested uh, uh, syntax in your, uh, in your code when you need to do a matrix multiplication, but this is uh, a, a pure naive matrix multiply here. Uh, what you should actually be doing is writing uh, this matmul operation here, which you can see at a very high level implements the exact same thing. Uh, A times B plus C and store into D. Um, so I'm not worried about uh, any of these loops everything is implicit inside of this intrinsic operation. And so not surprisingly, the, 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 this performs dramatically better than the, uh, the naive implementation. But what you should actually take away is without any code changes, I can support the V100, I can support the A100, and I'm even getting support here for uh, the uh, Tesla, the, the, uh, the A100 tensor cores as well. And so I'm writing high level code and getting all of the benefits of the hardware and the math libraries uh, without any code changes. So uh, this is just one example. Uh, we're not limited to matrix multiplication. We have a huge range of, of um, 
intrinsics were able to support uh, that are baked into the language. And so we're not just limited to C++ and Fortran. Um, Python has also become a very important language uh, within HPC, and we want to provide a similar level of support. Uh, Python is a little different in that it's not an ISO language, and in that Python developers tend to develop library packages that they build together. And so um, many of those packages have been organized into an ecosystem known as PyData. Uh, the PyData ecosystem really kind of goes back to when NumPy started back around the year 2000. And you can see this is a pretty simple code here. I build a four by four um, uh, matrix and you know, I add it to its own transpose. So very simple, high level operations here. Uh, if I want to run larger problems across something like a multi-core CPU, well, what I had to do actually was introduce more packages. So here is a package called Dask which takes and distributes my array and distributes my work. So you can see I can run a much larger problem because I'm running on uh, more resources, uh, but the code is a little bit different. I have to understand a little bit better how to uh, distribute my work into chunks and, and things like that. And it gets even slightly more complex as we go up to uh, larger clusters of nodes. Uh, but it, you know the code's fairly understandable, but it really would be nice to be able to get back to this code, original code on the left, which is very, very high level and easy to understand. And so uh, in NVIDIA, we're working on a package called Kunumeric, um, which is a, uh, aims to become a drop-in replacement for NumPy. And so you can go back to writing this original code, uh, very high level code, but now you see we're running a significantly larger problem and Kunu Merrick is actually handling the distribution of the data structures and the work under the hood for me. Uh, so we believe that uh, this is just a starting point. Uh, NumPy is a very fundamental package in, uh, in the PyData ecosystem, but we're going to expand this idea to, uh, to other areas as well. You know, people write Python code because uh, they can be productive. Uh, you know, the code on the left has purely sequential semantics. There's no uh, visual, uh, you can't see any parallels up here, you don't have any additional synchronization. Uh, you don't see any partitioning of your data to distribute it. Um, this is completely sequential semantics and it's completely composable with all other um, Python libraries. But even this code can be scaled up to a, a supercomputer using uh, Kunumeric. So we need to provide you with high degree of performance. And we really want to provide a, a transparent way of doing that. So run at any scale regardless of what hardware you have, whether it's one GPU or several GPUs or even a whole supercomputer. And going forward, that even includes things like our Grace CPU or our, uh, our DPU for the interconnect. We need to leverage all of the hardware. Um, so to give you an idea, um, here is a, a simple CFD application that was written for the CFD Python course by, uh, by uh, Lorena Barba's group. Uh, it's, uh, you know, solves the shallow water equation. And so it gives you a rough idea of the, the simulation here on the left. Um, this is a, an excerpt from the code and notice uh, there's really nothing to notice. Uh, the, the code is exactly how it was written before. And in this case, what we actually had to change uh, was uh, instead of importing the NumPy package, we import the, the Kunumeric uh, package. And otherwise, the, you know, the user code remains the same. You're writing the code exactly how you would have written it uh, with NumPy. Um, now, if all we wanted to do was to run NumPy code on a GPU, we could actually use a package called KuPy already. But Kunumeric, um, which is part of the Legate ecosystem, uh, enables us to actually run out to multiple GPUs and even across multiple nodes. So here we've weakly scaled out to 1,024 GPUs with no code changes other than changing the import statement from importing NumPy to Kunumeric. So we're really targeting... Um, you know, good weak scaling performance here with Kunumeric, and this is just one example of, uh, of that. Uh, another example here uh, comes from the, the Scikit image uh, package. It's a Richardson Lucy deconvolution. Uh, so here, uh, the code is largely unchanged from the reference code with one exception, and that is that uh, Kunumeric uh, supports n dimensional convolutions, whereas NumPy only does one-dimensional convolutions. So by supporting higher dimensional convolutions, we can expose a lot more parallelism and get better performance. Um, and even though it doesn't look like it, the, code, the, the graph on the right is also a weak scaling plot this time over uh, throughput. And you can see, again, we can get very good scaling up to 1,024 uh, GPUs. 
Now, lastly, you'd be right to, to ask, okay, what about uh, performance compared to uh, native code? And so here is an example where um, the Rapids team, which is uh, Rapids is a data analytics framework, uh, has a distributed join benchmark that, that they've written and hand-tuned using CUDA and MPI. Uh, and it's about 1,700 lines of code. So I can't put that up on the slide. I can point you to the, um, the GitHub where they've implemented this. And this is you know, hand-tuned by experts. I can, however, put the entirety of the Python code on the slide. And that's this up at the top. It uses uh, pandas and numpy. In this case, uh, we're using a, um, uh, a version of pandas that um, is kind of a, a pre-release version using the same techniques we use in Kunumeric. And you can see here that the code is uh, fairly easy to, uh, to write and to understand and gets pretty good uh, performance compared to the original. So here, the dark green is the original hand tuned code and the light green is the, um, uh, the Python uh, code using Kunumeric and, and uh, Pandas. So is there a performance difference? Sure, uh, this, at this time scale, you can see that uh, you know, the performance difference there. Uh, but uh, the difference in productivity of being able to write from idea to having a full uh, code here in about 12 lines of code versus 1700 lines, um, you know, I believe you know, more than offsets the, uh, the small, small loss in performance. Okay, so that's it in terms of programming models. I do want to highlight some, um, some of our math libraries because they're really a key part for um, HPC developers. Uh, the first one I'll highlight is Kublaz. Um, this is uh, probably our, um, our most widely used um, math library, at least within the HPC space. And it supports the full uh, BLAS level one, two, and three, plus a variety of extensions. And these extensions are things like uh, being able to operate in, in mixed precision, uh, operate across multiple GPUs, and perform uh, batched operations. So if you're very small matrix multiplies, for instance, you can batch them together and launch them all at once. So this is widely used in, in um, all sorts of domains. Um, and we've, um, we're constantly improving them over time. So here's a list of a few um, uh, fairly recent extensions. So uh, you know, I want to highlight here that um, when we release these math libraries or, uh, or tuned applications, uh, we don't just release them to the world and consider them done, but we're constantly improving our math libraries. So by adopting these math libraries, uh, you're able to get uh, the best performance on our platform and it will improve over time. So here, uh, what we're comparing is across all of these routines, um, the performance difference between what we released in 11.1 and what we've released in 11.6. And so you can see here that for some of these, uh, so, some of these uh, routines, we're getting close to a 7x performance improvement um, over time. And so you can, um, by using our libraries, you can expect uh, you know, performance improvements over time. Um, if you wanna take things up uh, one more level, we have uh, the Ku Solver. So Ku Blas was the kind of basic building blocks and Ku Solver is the higher level solvers such as LU, Cholesky and QR, as well as uh, Eigen solvers. Uh, so uh, Ku Solver has um, support for using the tensor cores in our, um, uh, on our hardware using a technique called iterative refinement. So that enables you that even if um, uh, the data type that you're computing on is not natively available in, in, in TensorCore, we can actually use these iterative refinement techniques to do parts of the calculation in lower precision and give you full precision uh, results in the end. So uh, again, here is uh, on the right, is uh, showing off some of the performance improvements we've seen across two of our routines, um, comparing um, 11.0 versus 11.6. Um, now, I don't want you to miss this last bullet here that we've added support for not just running Ku Solver across multiple GPUs on a node, but we actually have support now for running across multiple nodes as well. And I'll have a data, um, uh, a data graph on that in about two slides. Uh, QFFT, I think, is probably the, the other major library that's used very widely in scientific computing, and it does provide support for 1D, 2D, and 3D, and again, across uh, multiple GPUs. Um, this kind of eyesore chart on the right is showing a, a variety of performance improvements um, that, uh, that we've seen over, um, over a variety of different FFT sizes. So 
Uh, we've put out some recently some optimizations for very large FFTs and also uh, some performance improvements on the opposite end for um, for um, some of the smaller ones as well. So across all, all sizes, we've seen as much as a 10x performance improvement um, in the, the recent uh, releases. So um, our recent initiative within the math libraries team is to begin to support uh, larger systems at a whole system scale. And so um, there's two libraries that support that uh, now. Uh, the first is KuSolver, uh, which we released in uh, the 2111 dot release. So that's the uh, November 2021 release. And uh, we have support for both LU and Cholesky scaling across uh, multiple nodes. So here, um, the gray bar is the state of the art using a library called uh, Atlas uh, that scales up here to um, um, roughly 1,000 uh, 1, GPUs. Um, our um, KuSolver library, this here is the green bar, and you can see uh, increased performance and increased scalability out to a full 4,000 GPUs uh, automatically using uh, the KuSolver library. Uh, we're doing the same thing in KuFFT. Uh, so in QFFT, um, this was released more recently in uh, March of this year. Uh, you could do 2D and 3D FFTs uh, fully distributed. Um, our preference is towards slab decomposition. Slab decomposition gives a lot more uh, parallelism uh, to the GPU. So it looks something like this. Uh, but we also have preview support for pencil decomposition. Uh, we'd actually expect the performance to be a little bit lower because there's just not as much parallelism for us to exploit. And then we also have included some helper functions. If you already have code that's written to pencil decomposition, which works really well in your CPUs, uh, to help you to convert to slabs and back uh, to utilize this. So on the right, you can see here uh, for uh, double and uh, you know, single and double precision, uh, you can see us scaling up here, the problem size up to a, a 4,000 GPUs uh, in our um, uh, DJX SuperPod called Selene. And then the last thing I'll highlight that's a recent development in our math libraries is the device extensions. Uh, so device extensions enable you to compose our math libraries into your existing uh, GPU kernels. And the first one we've exposed here is uh, QFFT DX. And so it's actually pretty common with FFTs that you would perform perform an FFT. You do some operation on the, on the um, transformed data, and then you do the FFT to go back. And so this pattern is really common. And what happens here is you launch one FFT, your data gets read in from GPU memory, compute it on, you write it back out to GPU memory, you launch a kernel, again, read in from GPU memory, compute, write back out, and then launch the FFT again. So there's a lot of overheads here in these arrows that we want to help you reduce. So the dark green bar shows uh, this, uh, this workflow as three kernels. Uh, the purple bar is kind of our previous state of the art, which was using callbacks. So after your FFT is called, you can issue a callback that would uh, call this, uh, uh, this custom kernel. But we've, what we've now enabled is the device extensions where directly from your uh, kernel, you can call into FFT, our FFT library at the beginning and the end of your, um, of your kernel and completely eliminate those overheads. So uh, the, there's two benefits here. One is in uh, reduced kernel launches, but the bigger one is in reading the data onto the, your, uh, your GPU SM and, and leaving it there. And you can see we can actually get on, uh, particularly on small problem sizes, a very significant performance benefit. And eventually when the problem size gets large enough, the benefit kind of reduces. So uh, if you're doing a lot of FFTs, if you have this pattern in your code, I encourage you to go um, check out MathDX at this link. All right, and then finally, I want to talk briefly about our developer tools. Um, we have a huge range of developer tools available uh, from debuggers, uh, including command line debuggers like CUDA GDB, but also um, uh, debuggers in, uh, in Visual Studio as well. A uh, variety of pro uh, profilers, Insight Systems, which is the screenshot in the back, provides very high level data about um, you know, what kernels are running and, and where and what data movement is happening. It gives everything at a very high level. But eventually you've identified your important kernels and you want to dig in, understand those kernels. And that's uh, Inside Compute, which is the, the gray box in the front. Uh, CUPD is a generic API for, for tools. So we're not limited to just the tools that NVIDIA provides, but there's a huge range of community tools as well that implement CUPD and, 
and um, can profile our our uh, our systems. And then the NVIDIA Tools extensions, NVTX. If you've never used these before, they're really a great way to annotate your code so that when you pull it up in our profiler, you understand, okay, oh, this is my main solver and here are the activities happening within that main solver. And even if you don't have a GPU, you can use these, uh, these extensions to mark up your code and understand, all right, this is the region of my code that's taking the most amount of time. So here's where I'm gonna concentrate my effort on, uh, on, on using the GPU. Uh, we also have a tool called Compute Sanitizer, uh, which enables you to detect common mistakes uh, here we're detecting leaks, but you can uh, detect race conditions and other very common mistakes. And lastly, we have integrations into a variety of uh, IDEs, uh, Eclipse on, on all platforms, uh, Visual Studio, if you have a, a, a Windows laptop with, the, with Visual Studio, we integrate with that. And we also now have um, Visual Studio Code Edition. So if you are a user of Visual Studio Code, like I am, you can go into the marketplace and download um, the code edition, um, and this actually provides debugging directly in Visual Studio Code. So to brag about each of these tools, here's Insight Systems. Uh, it does provide both command line and GUI interfaces for uh, a variety of, of very high level features here. So you can see um, uh, each of these boxes representing uh, you know, GPU kernels and how they uh, interoperate with each other, including data movement. So gives you a high level of picture of exactly what your code is doing and identify uh, performance bottlenecks like uh, GPU page migrations or, or uh, you know, poor data movement and, and things like that. Uh, once you know what, you, what kernel you want to look at, Insight Compute uh, really lets you dig in um, on uh, and understand the performance. You know, is, my, uh, is my kernel bounded by the, uh, the compute performance versus the memory performance? Uh, you saw a picture on the previous slide showing a roofline model, which we uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab at, at, with NERSC. Uh, and it provides just a variety of, of ways that you can get all the way down to uh, the assembly level if you really want to, to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, Visual Studio Code Edition, this is a very new enhancement and enables you to do things like, you know, setting breakpoints and, uh, and inspecting variables, and understanding this. And it actually also works with if you use the remote SSH plugin to do uh, remote development. And uh, if you prefer, uh, we have the Eclipse Edition that's been around for, uh, for quite some time. Um, uh, CUDA GDB, this is actually the back end for a variety of debugging tools. Uh, and so uh, tools like Alinea DDT um, and, and other parallel debuggers use CUDA GDB uh, on the back end for, uh, for this, as do those other tools. And so uh, you could look in here and, and try to understand exactly what, you know, what's happening within individual CUDA threads uh, to, to debug, uh, debug your code. And then lastly, uh, Compute Sanitizer. If you ever used CUDA MemCheck in the past, uh, uh, Compute Sanitizer is the new CUDA MemCheck. It enables you to check for things like um, uh, accessing uh, arrays out of bounds, uh, leaking, uh, having race conditions in shared memory, uh, accessing uninitialized data, or you know, forgetting to, uh, to synchronize your, your threads. So it's a great tool. If, if your code fails, I'd say you know, this is really the tool to hit first to try to understand exactly what's going on. So to close out, I want to advertise again and say uh, everything I've shown you here it comes as part of the HPC SDK. Uh, I believe this is available on your system. And, and if you have a, a system, um, you know, a personal system or a, a laptop or whatever that you develop on, I encourage you to go check out and, and download the HPC SDK. Regardless of whether you have a, a GPU, it's a great, uh, a great starting point. And lastly, I'll leave this up here as uh, we had our developer conference back in March and there was a huge number of really relevant um, talks and I've, I've listed some of my favorites up here so that you can go back. All of these are available on demand for free off of our website. And so with, uh, with 10 minutes left, I'm gonna uh, open up the Slack here and see if there's uh, any questions that I can uh, answer. Um, if you do have questions, please uh, post them in the uh, 04 NVIDIA ecosystem um, Slack channel. So first one, and I'm glad you know, Rich Loft asked here, you know, why is the Lulesh example 2x faster than OpenMP? And there's actually a, a mixture of reasons there. So let me go back to that one. So. Uh, 
So, um, so we're referencing this, uh, the Lulesh application and how we see a, a roughly 2x performance improvement uh, across all of the compilers uh, switching programming models. And so there's two things that leads to that. One is uh, by staying in one programming language, the compiler is better, a, a better equipped to optimize the code. And so there's no jumping out of standard C++ into the OpenMP runtime uh, and, and uh, the OpenMP programming model. So it's better able to better optimize. That would account for a small percentage um, across a variety of codes. And on Maya, you saw it as something like two and a half, three percent performance improvement. In addition to that, if you look at this code, uh, I'm gonna be completely honest. I think actually this could be uh, more optimally um, paralyzed. So here on the right, you can see I'm doing a transform reduce as one operation. So here's the transform and here's the reduction. If you look at the code on the left, uh, here is the transform across threads and here is a serial reduction. So I think there are some optimizations that could be made in the baseline code uh, to improve it. In the case of Maya, we actually saw uh, some, some similar things there where the OpenMP code that they've been running for more than a decade actually turned out to have uh, some very non-optimal things in it that they didn't even discover until they rewrote it using standard C++ and identified, okay, uh, now I see you know, how it's done. And they actually went back and rewrote their OpenMP uh, to get comparable performance. So, uh, so it's really a mixture. I would argue um, suboptimal code, it takes up the, the larger portion of that, um, that performance difference. Um, so here is a question. Uh, what's, is there any similarity between Kunumeric and Jax.NumPy? Uh, uh, so Jax.NumPy is um, uh, uh, put out by, I believe, Google. Uh, and it's uh, a similar sort of goal of, have, of adhering to the NumPy uh, API um, and uh, being a drop-in replacement. So they have very similar goals. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Jax is only targeting um, you know, single node, whereas Kunumeric, we actually are targeting being able to extend that out to uh, your know, full system scale. Um, uh, Kunumeric is actually uh, built on a package called Legate, uh, and Legate enables this automatic distribution of uh, data structures and work. So I think the main advantage that we're targeting for Kunumeric is that you're able to scale up, uh, weekly scale up to all of the resources you have, whereas Jax is uh, more limited to, uh, to the individual GPUs. Um, is there a comparison between ISO C++ and CUDA on a given architecture? So if I go back to my last slide, what I would encourage you to go watch um, this, bot, this lowest one, this was put out by the University of Bristol. It was Simon McTosh Smith and Tom Deacon from University of Bristol. And they actually had two uh, benchmarks, uh, one that was compute bound and one that was memory bound that they wrote um, uh, using ISO C++ and using CUDA. And what they actually found was that the ISO C++ was uh, comparable performance to CUDA on both of their applications. So they go into a lot more details. So I encourage you to check uh, this talk in particular out for those sorts of details. Um, the question of the, the, the future C++ uh, being able to replace OpenMP, and does this statement apply to all platforms or just NVIDIA GPUs? It's, uh, it's our belief that, it, that you should be doing this on every platform. Um, you can take ISO C++ code today, uh, build it with G++, build it with Intel's compiler, build it with Clang++, and run it across um, um, all of the architectures that those, uh, those compilers support. And so... Um, you know, it's our belief that the importance of directives is, is reducing. The directives were designed to uh, fill in a gap in the, performance, in the programming languages. And now that those languages are addressing those gaps themselves, we're, we're really hoping that you're going to begin to develop far less with directives. So, yeah, we actually believe that you should be doing that on, on all platforms, not just NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, should I understand that all math libraries in the HPC SDK are accessible from all languages? C++, Fortran, and Python? Uh, yes, um, we are kind of catching up on um, the Python bindings. So some of the Python bindings might not be there yet. Um, and uh, reach out to me if there's one that you need that is not available yet. But we're going through using a, um, um, 
an initiative called CUDA Python to make sure that all of the uh, the libraries will have bindings to uh, to all of those languages. So, uh, if you find a gap, um, feel free to email me directly, and I'll pass that that gap on to uh, to the developers. Um, oh, I missed one from Adrian here about inside compute showing the roofline model uh, with achieved memory bandwidth, uh, but can't do the same analysis with L1 and L2. I think the latest version that we just shipped or the next version that we're about to ship has L1 and L2 lines as well. Can one do a reduction on a raise in Fortran do concurrent? So interesting that you ask that. Um, we, um, we are fixing that. So our currently our compiler does not support um, array reduction on do concurrent. However, we are uh, addressing that. And I kind of glazed over that, but I think you caught me. So here, uh, where I say stood par, and it says minimal open ACC. And so there's actually two places in the code where they needed to do an array reduction, and they couldn't because our compiler didn't support that yet. And so they used an open ACC atomic directive in each of those loops to accomplish the same thing. Uh, I don't know whether um, the array reductions will come in our next release because it's uh, coming out in the next week or two, uh, but it, we are working on getting it into the compiler very soon. So uh, the language supports the array reductions. The compiler uh, was lacking support until recently. And you know, is the HPC SDK available on Docker Hub? It is not. Um, it's available on NGC, which is our, um, our registry. So ngc.nvidia.com. Uh, and we have it packaged up there and you can actually uh, import it into, uh, you mentioned Singularity here, you can use it uh, with Singularity uh, and other runtimes. We use it internally with our uh, with the en route uh, runtime as well. So you can um, convert from the Docker container to a, a running Singularity container. And we do that uh, fairly often. All right, last call for questions. All right, then I'll uh, thank you for uh, for your time.